G'day guys, it's your coach here and we are talking all things Beasts of Chaos. We have Joel McGrath back, the overlord. And for anyone who remembers the faction focus and whinge to me about sound, I can happily tell you that we have airshipped Joel, the finest microphone, and he is ready to talk Beasts of Chaos. G'day, welcome back. G'day coach, thanks for having me mate. I had this moment in time where I thought he's going to, he's going to mess with me. He's going to like pretend to talk and like, just take the mickey out. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, no, I'm not that mean. So <laughs> it is my most complained about episode in my entire two and a half YouTube in career. Uh, so it's good to have the audio working, but you've got a lot more years of experience now with Beast of Chaos. And we're going to talk about two of your lists. Um, a lot has obviously changed. We've got General's Handbook 2020, which probably wasn't, didn't really do much for you, did it? I mean, if you went down the Slanish route, you might have got a little bit of a nerf. But, like, mm. generally, Beast of Chaos was kind of, like, they kind of, unless you were Thunderscorn, they they got yeah, some yeah. B boosts. They did. So um, Beast of Chaos are in an uh, interesting position where if you make any of the units any cheaper, then you end up, with, a, with an eel list or a Blight King spam list where it's just one war scroll. Um, you know, a lot of the war scrolls and beasts aren't really useful, but uh, you can still take a whole heap of junk and it still looks like a coherent army. So, you know, it, if you start dropping, like, Ungors down to 50 points or whatever, then you might as well just take, you know, 500 Ungor, so... Yeah, like yeah. like when I when I looked at it, I, I didn't think that you guys had got a nerf. I didn't think you guys got a boost. I thought I'm like, eh, eh. and and like Mister well, Chaos is a funny army, right? Like it's, I, I I don't think I don't think it's there's a problem with it. I think it's just a very nuanced play style, um, and it's one that I think people struggle with mostly. I don't know, Joel. I don't know what your thoughts are, but uh, that's that's for me. Like I don't see a lot of players picking it up. I'm not sure why. But yeah, you've done very well um, with it, which is obviously why we're talking here today. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, it's it, it's it's interesting because it definitely plays a lot differently to most other armies in the game. So it's very fast. Uh, a lot of the war scrolls don't do a whole lot, but you know you're putting bodies on the board and you win by movement more than anything. And uh, the little circles on the table called objectives. There, that's all you care about. Uh, and you know, normally in a game of Sigma, when you're playing just a more sort of traditional army, you're uh, waiting for your opponent to make a mistake and capitalize on it, right? Uh, in Beast of Chaos, you're in the driver's seat the whole time. As soon as you make that mistake, you're done. So yeah. uh, it's all about controlling uh, at what speed and what order uh, all your stuff dies on the board. So, yeah, it's very, very different to a regular army. And it's an interesting one as well. It was almost like the um, the 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 first army that Gits obviously got to enjoy because it's got like that combo mm. army, right? Like, uh, you know, Gits gets to to build its allegiance ability depending on how you want to build it with, you know, trolls, squigs, Gits. There's no one particular build. And and likewise with you guys, you've got so many different builds, you know, depending on how you want to go. And I think for some people that can be quite confusing. Do I go mm. all Thunderscorn? Do I go all Beast Herd? Or do I do a combo how do I then synergize with some of the monsters? You know, do I bring in a cockatrice? Do I bring in a, a chaos gargan or a Jabba Slyth? And I think for a lot of people, it can be quite challenging. So I'm really excited to look at two of your lists and kind of crack the nut and see why you do what you do. Mm, for sure. And look, I've got my own play style and my lists, they work for me and how I want to play and what I want to get out of the army, right? Uh, it may not uh, gel with everyone else, but it seems to work, at least for me. So that's... Yeah, that's what we're talking about today. <laughs> yeah, and, and obviously, you know, listening at home, uh, you can look at this list and go, yeah, I like that. I'll look at There's too many, I don't know, Ungor, for example. I prefer more of an X season to taste, yeah. but at least you kind of get the, the thinking and the ideas on how a highly competitive and successful Beast of Chaos player is playing because you have done very well, Joel. Um, mm. Not that I need to remind you that you've done really well, but uh, probably one of the few examples in the world for someone who has podium, who's done well at tournaments with beasts. I'll stop you there. I haven't podium with beasts, uh, but I've come fourth twice and fifth once. So yeah, it's uh, basically a podium. <laughs> top top yeah. ten at large events is basically a podium. The two events this year before lockdown kicked in, uh, I was 4-0 and going on to uh, table one in game five and uh, got pipped by clubmate 
both times. So <laughs> oh, that was SAGT. Yeah, so you got Saggy T and then also the one day in Geelong as well. Uh, both, uh, you know, both events was the same outcome, fourth and fifth. <laughs> For, with Beast of Chaos, that's that's, that's basically winning um, the, the biggest event in the world. So um, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> let, let's take the win. Yeah. What Before I get into your list and we kind of unpack <clears throat> the Allegiance abilities, all that good stuff, what drew you to Beast of Chaos and what are they good at compared to some of the other armies in the game? Uh, two reasons. Uh, firstly, I got them. I got both the Bray Herd and War Herd sides before uh, the Battle Tome uh, kicked in. So uh, the Bray Herd side had uh, Allegiance abilities in the General's Handbook 2017, I think it was the first one. Yeah, and, I think um, so. Yeah, so I'm like, oh, yeah, these guys look really cool. Um, before I started into Age of Sigma, I never played fantasy, but uh, I was always a 40K player. And uh, there was a moment in time where I said, you know, next edition of fantasy, whatever that may be, uh, it's either going to be Beast of Chaos or um, Wanderers. So Wood Elves. And uh, anyway, I went Wood Elves at the time uh, when Age of Sigma first dropped, quickly then jumped into Stormcast, then Beast of Chaos after that. And... Um, I've just always really liked the models. I uh, always really like the fluff, which is it's huge to actually enjoy what you're putting on the table instead of just like a just an army to win with. Um, you know, you need that sort of connection. Uh, anyway, the the second reason was also uh, I, I love playing armies which no one else does locally and doing well with them. Uh, that's something that I sort of uh, try and achieve. So I used to play Slanesh as well before the Battle Tome, and uh, same again, no one played them. Uh, everyone thought they were shit. So I said, you know what? I'm going to pick up this army and I'm going to win with it, which I did. <laughs> that that re that reminds me a lot of when I very first got into Sigma, I was out to prove a point that the what we now call Cities of Sigma, when well before the free people had allegiance abilities and when they got allegiance abilities, I was running that to prove a point because no one else was running it. And there is, it is rewarding because no one expects anything of you. If you lose most of your tournaments, you're like, eh. Yeah, that's yeah. what you expect. But the moment you go three and two or four and one, people really notice. While if you went four and one with Seraphon, you're like, eh, it's kind of what I expected. Yeah, so well, what? That, that noob dropped a game, useless. <laughs> hey, what's wrong with you? Why couldn't you go five and oh? Um, but that, that and and it's quite interesting as well because um, people, I, I find the community is really supportive because we're all trying to like crack the code together. We're like, how do we make this work? And, you know, we get a lot of talking. I used to use TGA. I'd use Twitter. And, you know, you talk list tech. And the minute someone gets a win, you're like, yeah, what did you do? And um, I don't know. I just find it very supportive, especially in those uh, in those armies that people aren't really running because that community is so small. Mm. Yep. I agree. All right. I'm going to bring up the, the allegiance abilities. And I would like your perception and I guess your thinking behind is it useful? How do you use it? Uh, why is it important? Because I don't think all of it is important in all of the army. So let's talk first things first, you get a terrain piece, which is cool. Yep. You know, uh, I, I actually think it's probably one of my favorite terrain pieces in the game. It's, it's a good size, but it's not massive. Uh, and I think it's interesting, but it's simple. So the herd stone, you get this, this herd stone. So after territories are set up, but before, sorry, after territories have been chosen, but before players uh, begin to set up their armies, you set up a herd stone uh, wholly within your own territory, more than 12 inches away from enemy territory and more than one inch away from uh, other territory. How important is the herd stone to you? And what's some of the <clears throat> logic behind where you put it down and how you like to use it? Sure. Well, firstly, um, the, the herd stone to me is the best terrain piece in the game. Uh, purely for what it does uh, you know, to your army as well as the opponent's army, which you're going to touch on in a sec, but uh, also for the summoning, which we'll get to a little bit later. Uh, it's for a free piece. It's just so good. And as you are saying, it's a small footprint, so you can squeeze it where you sort of want to more often than not, and that is actually probably centre of your deployment zone, 12 inches away from your enemy deployment always. So obviously the benefits are going to come in a minute, but uh, yeah, the the size is is really handy and it means it's all quite flexible. While I, I love my Gits terrain piece, but it is quite a large size, and and keeping it away from other other uh, terrain pieces and the objective can be quite difficult. So love that ability. 
Next up is you've got uh, a few extra things. So you've got the Bray Herd, um, the Bray Herd ambush. So with your keyword Bray Herd units, um, instead of setting up the Bray Herd unit on the battlefield, you can place it to the side and say it's going to be basically an ambush. So it's a reserving unit. Uh, you can set up one reserved unit uh, for. Sorry, sorry, you can set up one reserve unit in ambush for each beast of chaos unit that's set up on the on the battlefield. Now you've got to bring that in your at the end of your first movement phase, and it has to come in six inches from a table edge, nine inches away from an enemy. Um, and if you can't set it up, it's slain. So you've got to bring it in the first turn, and it's obviously within six inches of a of a uh, an edge edge of the field, nine inches from an enemy. So uh, this is really handy to, you're up against, uh, I don't know, what, what's the new army getting around on uh, tabletop? Uh, Seraphon. It's the, yeah, or you got Seraphon, but that's not so yeah, much look. an issue. It's more the uh, the one drop AD Archer Lumineth build. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, your, cause, your water build. Yeah, it's going to cause uh, Beast of Chaos a bit of grief. So uh, if you're building primarily into Brayherd, like what I do, it's not so much of an issue because you can just uh, you know, take put half of it off the edge and then you're asking more questions to your opponent that way. Um, it's also really handy uh, for the combos that we're going to get into a little bit later, but I'll touch on it briefly now. Uh, I like something on a spawn um, and uh, deep striking or ambushing in like 10 Bestigal. Uh and I can pump up their attacks and just take something off. For example, uh, when I was playing against Petrifex Elite at SAGT, well, one of the Petrifex Elites, I took Arkan off turn one by doing this, just uh, landing that nine-inch charge, giving them about ten extra attacks and just taking them off. <laughs> Nasty. So, yeah. Comes your in handy. Bra the keyword Bray Herd, I I'm imagining that is your Ungor, that is your Bestigor, that is... Yep. Yeah, all the shaman, or all, all, yep. all the goats. So not your, like your dragon ogres, not like your cockatrice or your chaos gargan or your jabberslite. It's your no. goat troops. Yes, that's right. And you can get warherd and thunderscorn to ambush as well by taking the dark walkers uh, allegiance, which uh, I've got in one of my lists here. So we'll yeah, yeah, that's a really good call out. So one of the next things we'll talk about is the gray phrase. That's your sub allegiance essentially. And yes, one of them, the Dark Walkers, extends that ability from outside of just being Brayherd keyword to be more options. So uh, good to know if you want to be able to ambush something that's not quite your Ungor, for example. Uh, the other rule before we get to the Great Frays is you get your uh, Creatures of the Storm. So basically, uh, at the start of your hero phase, roll a dice. Each friendly Thunderscorns, so that's like your Dragon Ogres, your Shagoth, things like that, um, mm -hmm. those those units, uh, mm. if they're outside of three inches from an enemy, basically they can move that dice roll number, uh, but they can't move within three inches of an enemy. So you're getting a free little move in the hero phase. Um, I've played against a full Thunderscorn army and it was useful. I haven't really seen a lot of Thunderscorn outside a complete build of Thunderscorn. That's actually um, that uh, all Thunderscorn list is something which I'll be building towards and playing probably next year because of COVID. But um, yeah, just you know, nine units of Thunder uh, of um, Dragon Ogres and a couple of Shagos uh, with the points drops. I find them really useful in their one drop battalion. Uh, so yeah. Hopefully, was, I'll be able to get like, it on the table at some stage. <laughs> it was it was quite difficult uh, playing playing against Chris Tot with his you know complete Thunderscorn army. They are uh, it was it was very interesting, but certainly you know and it was very more I guess um, much more elite than you would traditionally see in the beast list. Yeah, yeah, it's got drawbacks, but you know we're playing Beast of Chaos here. The whole faction has drawbacks. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> you, you, you know what you're getting yourself into when you when you sign up to a Thunderscorn Beast of Chaos army. That's right. You've got your blood blood gorge. So at the end of the combat phase, uh, if any attacks made by the war herd, so that is your um, what are the minotaurs called? The um, bulgors, Bul doom bulls, Bul yeah. and gorgon. Yeah, I remember playing uh, Ken Sattler. Wow. His his very war herd focused wow. army. Uh, the dog's really excited about war herds. So if at the end of the combat phase, uh, any attacks made by a war herd unit in combat destroys any enemy unit, they heal D3 wounds allocated to the war herd unit. 
So I'm seeing here that, you know, whether you go with the Bray Herd, the Thunderscorn or the War Herd, there's something here for everybody. You obviously can miss, mix and match. So if you want to have War Herd and Bray Herd, you can get tap into both or you can really double down and focus on one of the three. That's right. How do you find the, the War Herd ability? Is that just useful? I, 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 uh, four wounds, five wounds for like a bull gore? Four? Yeah, yeah. So they're four wounds. Doom Bull's eight, I believe, and then like a Gorgon and Saga are 14. So uh, traditionally they're you know, more of a more of a um, distraction. Uh, so having them the ability to heal every now and again is actually quite handy, especially if you're sending them into units which are mostly dead anyway just to finish something off. Uh, so they've taken a few splash mortals from, I don't know, a comet or uh, being shot at or whatever, they can charge in, hopefully kill something, and then, uh, yeah, they can heal up some wounds. So it's definitely could, handy to have. Could be the difference between your your uh, Psygore, for example, being in a different bracket for their, um, for their yeah, so that, that D3 could be quite handy, um, keeping them yeah. as, I guess, as healed up as possible. It's not going to regenerate a bull gore, but... Uh, it's get, it may may keep one from dying, so that's yeah. that's quite well, useful. Well, if one's taken three wounds, it's still alive and it can heal up. One, so yeah. yeah, but if one, it, it's not going to bring back a dead one. Um, no, which no. I'm sure you'd love. You've got the <laughs> you've got the gray phrase. We won't talk too much about the gray phrase because of the three, you can choose either all herds, dark walkers, or gave spawn. You don't have to choose one. Joel, is that correct? You don't have to choose one. It's an option. That's right. It is an option. Uh, there is a few good command traits and other artifacts throughout the book as well. Just depends on what you're trying to get out of your build, really. But I tend to like two of those out of the three more so than any of the uh, other options available. So if you do choose the All Herds, the Dark Walkers, or the Gave Spawn, it does mean that your command trait and your first artifact is allocated to you. You must take it because that's what Gave Spawn gives you, for example. So if yep. you choose not to take it, you obviously can do a bit more customization. But uh, I, I like some of these rules. Dark Walkers for me is the one that kind of I really like. But I know you've also given us a Gabe Spawn list. So yeah, yeah, everything has its use. Uh, I yeah, I I've just been playing with Gabe Spawn the most, and I find that to be the best in my specific build that I take to tournaments. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious to learn a bit more because I, I looked at Gabe Spawn and I, when I was doing the research, I'm like, okay, it sounds interesting. Um, I certainly, for me, Dark Walkers <clears throat> is the one that stands out and it did stand out when I very first read the book. Um, yep. I don't see a lot of All Herd, um, but that might just be my community or what I see. Yeah, uh, look, All Herd, all, sorry, all Herd is dead in the water now that the Ether Quartz Bridge is gone uh, just because that relies on farming command points to then generate more summoning points to then summon on, you know, some garbage in the in the list that we're going to touch on in a sec. <laughs> and speaking of summoning, that's the last and probably the most attractive part of your allegiance ability, which is the primordial call. So basically what happens, folks, is you get summoning points. Um, and what I love about your summoning points uh, compared to poor old um, uh, corn is that once you spend your points, you don't reset back to zero. You just take it out of the balance. So I do I do feel sad a little bit for corn. But basically what happens here is uh, you can summon on a beast of chaos unit onto the battlefield if you have enough points. The way you generate your points is at the start of the hero phase, you get one primordial core point. Mm -hmm. In addition, in your hero mm -hmm. phase, you can choose one beast of chaos hero within three inches of the hearthstone. Um, uh, you set up at the battlefield, yet yeah, cool. Um, and then basically what happens is you do a little bit of a stabby stabby. So basically that hero um, is going to do D3 mortal wounds to that piece of chaos unit. And then for each of the mortal wounds that is inflicted to that unit, you generate an additional primordial call. So potentially, correct me if I'm wrong, you can generate up to four primor primordial calls if you do the stabby stabby. Correct. Yep. Minimum of two, maximum of four. Traditionally, I have a shaman uh, babysitting the herdstone. He's my barbecue master, and he's throwing ungor onto the fire. So uh, you know, he's slitting their throats and cooking them up and uh, sacrificing them to the dark gods. <laughs> I love. I love it. Yeah. I love. It. That's so cool. And, and you do see that a lot. You do see that little shaman, that shaman that hangs out next to the um, 
to the to the herdstone uh, and you yep. do they have that one sacrificial unit of ungore that's just like it's literally just there to summon but you've got some cool things to summon you've got the chimera you've got a, a gorgon you've got zangor skyfires you've got bull gores you've got jabba slice you've got uh besticors you've got cockatrice you've got <clears throat> gores and ungores and chaos spawn and they vary from 10 points to three points so you probably could bring on something at minimum every turn or you could save your points up for something really big and exciting joel of the what looks like maybe about 15 to 20 options are they all useful or what's your thinking behind the points uh so what i what i tend to summon is uh if i am having a tight game which most of them are it's usually i'm only ever spending three or four points on a unit at a time I'm never saving up to, you know, bring on the Chimera or the or the Gorgon. Just a waste of time because that's taking three turns to do minimum, right? Uh, I like to bring on a Spawn in Gave Spawn. Uh, I also like to bring on Ungor, Ungor Raiders, maybe even a Tusk or Chariot if I'm, you know, feeling exotic. <laughs> uh, it, you know, more bodies win games with Beast of Chaos especially and if you're, you can just spend three points, which you get for basically nothing. Uh, to bring on 10 more. And, um, yeah, that, that's clutch. It can win your games, hands down. Like, uh, it's been a few games against change hosts, which I've won uh, by summoning on, you know, something. Uh, there, you know, someone on the backfield, actually a knife to the heart, especially. Uh, you know, land that charge and win the game, just like that. So, yeah, it's really handy. And that's probably another thing we didn't talk about just yet, is when you do sacrifice your points, so you spend <clears> some of that primordial call, Basically, the unit comes on. The summon unit is set up wholly within six inches of the battlefield edge, not more than nine inches from the enemy. So you don't have to summon it next to the, the Hearthstone, um, which is one of the limitations for me as a Gits player because my grots come back at the terrain piece. You have the ability to bring it on anywhere on the table and threaten that objective that's been left behind to bring something on. And if, you, if you're losing uh, a certain part of the combat on a table, you can bring in reinforcements and go for that charge or, you know, help bring on a chronomatic cogs to make it easier for you to make the charge. Yep. Is there, yep. is there anyone that maybe you wouldn't touch um, once that you just like, it's just like absolute last resort? Uh, well, that seems as more that I wouldn't summon compared to more that I would. I'll touch on what I do summon. Uh, so okay. Ungor, Ungor Raiders, Spawn, maybe a Tusk or Chariot and Best of Gores. Uh, they're the only ones I ever bring on. Not you, not even like Zango, not not Skyfires. <clears throat> no, nah, no, nah, I don't even own Sky, uh, Skyfires, man. I think Mark Beasts are absolutely weak and pathetic. Uh, is that a? <laughs> it, is, it is a limitation. It is a limitation on myself, but it's also narrative. So, <laughs> and they are ten points. That takes you really three turns to bring on three Skyfires. So, yeah. Like compared to as you what you said, you know, ten Ungor, uh, a, a Tusk or Chariot, uh, a Chaos Spawn, which you could generate a turn, two turns at most. Um, I can see you want those rapid fire bodies out as opposed to trying to summon something. And by the time it gets into combat, it's turn four, and really, how much you're going to do with it? <clears throat> That's right. There's just no point waiting around for that ten. Uh, the only time I do summon on like a a chimera or something well, actually sorry there is something else that i do summon on it's uh, the cockatrice which is five yes. points so you can get that up to uh, on turn two and they're great to uh half the time reliably kill uh something maybe <laughs> yeah <laughs> so, like, uh, four, they... four, four up mortal wound gaze its base is quite generous so you can sneak that in pretty pretty easily yeah. around the table yeah so i think it's on a 50 or a 60 mil round and um yeah on a four up d6 mortal wounds great for sniping off a like a little foot hero or something so yeah i'm yeah. a big fan of the um, tries not like <clears throat> not not actually using it on the table i've just had this weird uh wonderful love of the cockatrice um i wish i could deep strike it with dark walkers i love like four four dark walking cockatrice coming on the side of the board but i know i can't do it because it's not a part of the rules <laughs> They're actually the uh, – they went down 10 points in the GHB and they're the cheapest monster in the game. So uh, something to consider these days as well is uh, what certain battlefield roles or keywords and how they affect uh, the battle plans that you're playing. So focal points, for example, you could take a couple of cockatrice and you're getting two extra points for just having them. Uh, yeah, 
it's something that I've considered for sure yep. building lists uh, going forward. So. Although you do have to remember that summon units don't take on the battlefield role. So, for example, yeah, if they you do summon have the monster here, keyword. Yeah, that's the only exception. So, if you summon yeah. on, let's say your your gores or your ungore, they don't take on the battle. They don't take on the um, the battle line role. But yes, the monster um, from the cockatrice or the chimera, that's a keyword as opposed to a role. So you do keep that one. That's right. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so the first one, the first list we'll, we'll talk about, and uh, before we get there, we'll put a bit of a context and a bit of flavour around the allegiance that wraps around the list and how you're going to take advantage of Gave Spawn. So Gave Spawn's going to give us a couple of things. So first things first, you've got the gifts of, I'm not going to try to pronounce that, but basically uh, the, if a friendly Gave Spawn hero is slain, roll a dice before removing, off, uh, removing the model. On a two plus, the chaos, uh, a, a, a one chaos spawn is added to the army. Set up the chaos spawn anywhere on the battlefield within six inches of the slain hero. Uh, and if the hero has the corn noble slanish, uh, and that's probably another call out here as well, you can mark your beast of chaos, which is kind of cool when you start building some synergies. But that's based off battalions, right? That's right. Yep. Yeah. So I can't just mark it like slaves to darkness, but there is a battalion that allows me to mark it corn, zench, nurgle, or slanish. Talk to me about this ability. So each of your heroes that die <clears throat> to pass, you get a freak out spawn. Yep. Uh, so I love this rule. Uh, it's saved saved uh, my ass a few times actually, uh, just because of the restrictions on how to place it after you roll the two plus. So before you remove the model, two plus, you put a spawn anywhere within six inches, not wholly within. doesn't have to be outside of three inches of enemy models. So what you can actually do is if it dies, uh, I don't know, say in the shooting phase or whatever, and someone's got a unit that they want to charge, <clears throat> excuse me, you can um, just set them up, uh, what, nine inches plus uh, the length of the base. So it's about 10 and a half inches in front of effective uh, shutting off a charge for the turn. Um, which is really handy uh, because then, you know, all your goats survive and then they're stuck fighting a spawn. Uh, spawns also in Gave Spawn, uh, they work, they function very similar to what heroes do. They don't get the hero keyword or the um, the ability to use regular command abilities, but their command ability here is uh, the, the main attraction of um, Gave Spawn, which basically pick a unit wholly within 12 inches uh, for a command point, plus one attack, and that's spammable. So you can give a unit plus two, three, four, ten attacks, depending on how many command points you've got. So you want them on the board. I like that ability as well. Um, it's not restricted, so you can uh, put that Chaos Spawn in combat. So it doesn't say, it just says it has to be within six inches of the slain hero. It doesn't have any restrictions of being, you know, outside of nine inches or not setting up within combat. It's just within six. So... Uh, that could keep an opponent in combat for a little bit longer. As you said, if it was taken down in shooting, you might be able to tie up a unit by by like essentially flinging it forward or flinging it to the side within six of that slain hero. Yeah. You know, there's also been times where, say, uh, my Beast Lord, uh, so my general of the, the Gave Spawn usually, he's gone into a big monster and he's you know, tried to kill it because he thinks he's awesome. Uh he dies after doing a whole heap of damage to, you know, whatever. Say, say a terror guy, so I was left with one or two wounds. Uh, the terror guy turns around, kills the beast lord. Then the spawn comes on and then finishes off the terror guy. That's happened to me more often than not. It's just awesome when it does. <laughs> yeah, and you just laugh at them. You're like, lol, yep. cow spawn took yep. out your terror guy. Things <laughs> <laughs> look at their face. Yep. You've, you've got Unraveling Aura, so this general can attempt to unbind one spell uh, in the enemy hero phase uh, as if it was a wizard. If it's already a wizard, uh, this, is a, this is obviously the command trait that comes with your general. Uh, if they're already a wizard, so you've taken um, a, great, a, a great shaman, for example, uh, you can uh, unbind one additional spell in the enemy hero phase. So it's not bad. It's really good. It's it, for, for something that you have to take, it's actually really good in this army because there's not a lot of magic defense. So having an extra unbind floating around on a hero who wouldn't be able to normally unbind is really good. So, Yeah, that's actually quite useful. Um, so if, if, you, if, your wizard, if your wizard is the general, boom, you've got an extra unbind. If not, you've got an unbind somewhere else on the table. Happy days. 
Finally, you've got uh, the artifact. So the artifact, the uh, the mutating null blade. So pick one of one of the bearer's melee weapons. <clears throat> add two to the damage characteristic of that weapon. However. Each unmodified hit roll of a one for the attacks made by the weapon inflicts one mortal wound upon the bearer after all of the bearer's attacks are made. So basically it does plus two damage, but for every one to hit, uh, unmodified roll of one to hit, you're going to hurt yourself. That's right. Uh, best put on... The, the best bang for buck from this is definitely on a Beast Lord just because he has six attacks base, re-rolls ones to hit naturally, and can re-roll wounds against uh, monsters and heroes. Uh, uh, so. so you don't have to spend a <laughs> command point to avoid that damage. Obviously, it still can that's happen, right. but the chances, because you're, you're naturally re-rolling ones, um, that's yeah. a nice little combo. So we say Beast Lord. Yeah. Yep, so Beast Lord uh, puts him to three damage, which is great. Uh, it's also good on a Doomball or a Shagoth because they then go to five damage per swing, but they've only got three attacks each. So it's is that all? Yeah, is that all? That's all. Yeah, that's all. So, yep. so the first list we're going to go through, and this is the Gave Spawn list, and then the next list we'll go through is the Dark Walkers list. So, what have you got on the table here? So, we've got the Gave Spawn uh, coming out of the realm of Gur, uh, which I'm sure we'll learn about very soon and why we've taken Gur. But you've taken the Great Bray, Sh uh, so the Great Bray Shaman, who's the general. The command trait is that unraveling aura. The artifact is the unknowing eye. And you have the tendrils of astro what was it? Astrophy. Atrophy. Um, yeah, atrophy. You've also got another great bray shaman, uh, same spell. And then you've got a doom bull with the mutating null blade, that one that we just talked about with the damage. So talk yeah. to me about why you what why you've taken these two wizard heroes. Why is one your general? What's the logic behind some of these decisions? Sure. So when uh, you've got a beast lord or a bray shaman as the general, it unlocks Bestigals as battle line. Now, my list is mainly battle line to begin with, but uh, you know, going back to what I was saying before about the new battle plans and how battle line interacts with the, the battle plans, uh, it's, yeah, it's just better to have more than less, right? So that's the only reason. Uh, it used to be a, a beast lord in the list, but I've since um, added in a warherd element just to give me a little bit more punch. So, yeah, that, that's, all, that's all there is to so that. Um, that's that's annoying. Yeah. But... Yep. The Knowing Eye artifact is uh, the poor man's choice at Epicord's Brooch. So uh, on a 4 plus in your hero phase, you get an extra CP, uh, which is handy because uh, in Gave Spawn, you're using those CP a lot. Uh, and in just basic chaos in general, uh, you want to be uh, passing Battleshock tests when you're not in range of the Herdstone. So, yeah. Where else are you spending your CP? So uh, are you re-rolling charges from the side of the board? Are you... Is it re-rolling attacks? Like, where do you find you that you spend most of your CP? Uh, spending my CP mostly on Gave Spawn plus attacks, and then I'm also using it on uh, run rolls up to six on, like, turn one or two, just whenever I need it. If I roll that one on, say, that unit of 30 best of gore, I'll always change it to a six. Because uh, uh, best of gores and all the goats actually can run and shoot. Oh, sorry, run and, run and charge. Uh, and then uh, raiders can run and shoot. So... Uh, uh, when they're in range of a Bray Shaman as well, uh, the Bray Shaman gives them plus three inches. So you're essentially, with all the uh, Bray Herd, uh, they're moving 10 plus D6 inches. So, so that's really that speed that you're talking about. You want to get in yeah. there, you want to smash face, you want to really dominate the board, take up with from a board control perspective, and the ability to run and charge is pretty sexy. That's right. And here I am getting excited that I can shoot and charge with my pistol ears. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and we know why you get the Doom Bull there. Obviously, one, a combat beat stick, eight wounds. There's a whole bunch of damage. And that uh, Null Blade combines quite well because you've got the natural reroll ones to hit uh, and just does absolute damage, getting the plus two damage from the artifact. Yeah. Yeah. He doesn't actually get the natural reroll ones to hit, but... Uh, with the battalion that I've got, you need a Beast Lord or a Doom Bull. Uh, and I opted for the Doom Bull because his command ability actually benefits the Bulgors, gives them plus one to wound. So, uh, uh, the Beast Lord is the one who gives you the reroll ones to hit, not the Doom Bull. Yes, that's right. Okay, but the Doom Bull still bloody hurts. Yeah, well, he's just cool, isn't he? <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, he is cool. I, I did. I, I played against one recently, and it was like priority number one because I know when it gets in there, it just wrecks face. Yeah. 
the the units you've got. So you've got a lot of different units here. Normally it's not nearly as long, but it kind of complements Beast of Chaos quite well. So you've got 30 Bestigor, 10 Bestigor, six Bull Gores with Great Axe, one Chaos Spawn, 10 Gores, 10 Ungores, 10 Ungores, 10 Ungor Raiders, 10 Ungor Raiders, 10 Ungor Raiders, 10 Ungor Raiders. You also have a Gorgon, Gorgon, and you have the Desolating Beast Herd with the the wildfire Taurus and an extra command point. Yeah. All right, that was a lot to unpack. <laughs> Let's go to the top. So um, what fits in the battalion? And then we'll talk about the best to go and all the different unit choices. So this list is actually a two drop list uh, oh. because I have the spawn on the table. Everything else goes in the battalion. Uh, Desolating Beast Herd, uh, when I my units are wholly within enemy territory, uh, six is to hit and two hits. So it's not anything flash, but it's it's still pretty good, right? And it's basically uh, marking them as Slanesh and running them in Slanesh Allegiance, but you're still in basic chaos. Uh, plus, it's you got lots of units in the in the battalion, right? So you can take up to six units of Ungor flavors. Uh, yeah, you can take three sort of heavy hitters at Bestigors or Doom uh, Bulgors, which is why there's only the three units of those in there. Um, yeah. Uh, it's just a really good battalion just to fit everything in. So, I mean, it explains why you want to get up, up the board as fast as possible because you want to be in their side of the territory to increase the damage output. Yeah, that's right. A a any logic behind why you've taken 30 best to go and 10 best to go? Why not go 20 20? Why, why go two units? Like, <clears> what's, the, what's the thinking there? So, the 10, firstly, I uh, mentioned earlier how they uh, came on and one shot Ark in the Black off turn one. Uh, I always tend to ambush with those ten. It, it's just a nice little threat. Uh, they can they can do lots of damage um, in the right you know, circumstances. Plus, uh, they're a small a small footprint. So you've got um, when you're only uh, sitting up within six inches of the edge, it's hard to get maximum uh, value out of say a unit of thirty who's strung halfway up the board because they can't fit. So the ten. It's nice and cheap. It's a more of a throwaway unit than anything, but they can put on the herd as well. So good yeah. screen then, can be a harasser, easy to put on the table. You're right. Bringing thirty on the side of the board, the, while it sounds attractive, can be quite difficult to do. Mm. They're actually uh, more often than not the only unit that I ambush. So okay, just to put it into perspective. Uh, then the thirty, well, they're just. Something which to uh, you know sit back after the the layers of screens that I've got set up and uh, punch at the right time. They're they're like the scalpel unit. So they, yeah, they they're Correct. the ones usually benefiting from a spawn as well. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong. The, the best to go, the best to go, the ungore and the ungore raiders all can come on the side of the board <clears throat> if you want to. They've all got prey herds. Yeah, yep. so that's a lot of threat. That's a lot of yes. threat. And a lot of psychology you can put to your opponent because they just don't know. They might think that you're going to alpha almost all of those units. Mm. Well, when you when you tell people that stuff can move sixteen inches before it charges, they tend to sort of, you know, deploy it back a little bit. Uh, but I'm never really sort of going in turn one and and you know blasting. So it's just the unit of ten that I sort of send in. Use the Ungor Raiders in there just to move up and box them into their deployment just to. Just so I've got board board control, you know, I'm scoring the objectives there. Not my army's not really dying at that stage either. So that's that's the idea. I love it. There's um the psychology and the disappointment when they realise you're only going to ambush ten beast best to go, and they're thinking you're going to do this and this, and I'm going to screen here, I'm going to string out my units, I'm going to try this. When actually it's just like one unit. You're like, oh, I wouldn't have done that <laughs> if I knew this. I wouldn't have done what I just did. Yeah, yeah, they you know take an extra ten minutes in deployment just to make sure everything's nice and spread out <laughs> for nothing. I did it all the time when I used to play Legion of Night, and I would do that because you can ambush up to three units, and I'd mess with people like, "Oh, I'm gonna put my Terra in reserve." It was my last drop, and I never did. And they're like, "Oh, I've screened the whole board trying to avoid this Terra Geist," uh, and I just put it on the middle of the board and run it at your face. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you've got six bulgors. Um, what what a what a bring bulgors bring to the table? Bulgors are what I'd call my mop up crew. I don't know if there's like a specific phrase or role for a unit. But I just call it the mop up crew. Basically, uh, they're they're a second threat. They're also a target for my opponent to say shoot at. 
um, six unit, uh, six balls with four wounds each. So it's thirty wounds. Um, thirty. I don't know. Whatever. Whatever maths. Twenty-four. <laughs> no, it's, 24 a fr- it's a Friday wounds. night. It's a Friday night. Yeah. Like, I've had a few people cans. do the math. <laughs> Um, you know, they're a bit of a wound sink too. So, uh, you know, you do four wounds to them. You only kill one model instead of, say, four bestigors. So it's a bit discouraging too. Um, so they can tend to just do whatever they want to. Typically, they're not very good, but when they do actually do something, it's amazing. Um, they're always, more often than not, staying in range of the herdstone. So uh, firstly, they're immune to battle shock in it, and then they're also getting an extra point of rend. Uh, which is great. So that uh, expands every six inches, right? So they're slowly moving up the board. Uh, once all the bestigors and the Angor raids and all that die, they're there to clean up. That's the, that's the idea. And they're war herds. So they get to heal D3 wounds if they kill a unit, yeah? That's right, yep. <clears throat> so they can take and, and by the way, punch. I was just going to say the Maths Hammer is 24 wounds in that unit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so they, they've got access to mortal wounds as well, neg two rend. Uh, they can put the herd on. You just need to roll dice, really. Uh, really good, again, uh, again with a spawn because they've got two attack profiles on their war scroll, so their horns and also their uh, big axes. So they're getting plus two attacks for every one command point that you're pumping into them. So they're really good candidates for that. Just Speaking of chaos spawns, you've got, you've got one chaos spawn. So why one? And I guess for you've just said this list is a two drop, and the only thing that doesn't fit in is the chaos spawn. So it must mm. bring a lot in. The, it must bring a lot to the table for you to go from a one drop to a two drop for a fifty point unit. Yeah. So uh, I have played this list without a spawn in it, but it's just better with one because, it's, for for example, if someone comes at your turn one, you you've just played defensively in your turn or whatever. Uh, and then they've come at you, they've burnt through a whole heap of stuff, you win priority. Uh, you're doing a lot more damage with the spawn on the table than what if, what you would if you didn't have one. Uh, plus then uh, it's in position, in a better position, because you're not summing it on. So, yeah, it, it needs to be in there, in my opinion. If it's not, uh, you, get, uh, you can't do the damage, even though uh, Beasts of Chaos don't do a whole lot. It's just you, you need it on. <laughs> I prior to this conversation, I would have never have thought you'd be so passionate about cow spawns. Um, yeah, well, you got to be when you're playing Gave Spawn, mate, because you know that's that's what happens when you ascend to godhood in their eyes. Yeah, you turn into a spawn. <laughs> but yeah, they do play a vital part in the army. <laughs> Crazy that a fifty point unit, uh, which most people would overlook, uh, is so vital to your list. So um, I like it. You've got. A unit of gores, 10 gores. Yep. So they're the battalion tax. Uh, gores are shit. Uh, but it's either that or a tusk or chariot. And I prefer the bodies on the board compared to the chariot. So Good screen can there. defend the bull gores for the, I guess, the second wave. Yeah. Can you stabby they're, stabby they're actually, the gores? They're, they're, the, um, they're the gores. You can, yeah, but I prefer to uh, do it on ungore. Uh, gores have a four plus save in combat, so they're not too bad. They just mm. don't do any output. So they are usually the screen for the best of goals. Uh, sorry, gotcha. the, the bull goals. Your bull goals. Yeah. Uh, you do have 10 units of ungore, so I assume one is a stabby stabby, maybe two is a stabby stabby. Um, mm-hmm. They fit in the battalion. What else do they bring to the table other than cheap wounds? Like six, 60 points for 10 wounds is, is pretty delicious. Yeah, yeah, six points of wound is awesome. Uh, so one's definitely on herdstone duties. Uh, the other one is backfield screening or forward screen. But I tend to be using the Raiders more uh, forward than anything because they've got the shooting attack as well just to do a couple of chip wounds. So, And then you have four units of 10 Ungor Raiders. Again, quite yep. cheap, 80 points for 10, a little bit more expensive than your Gauls and your Ungors, but still um, 10 wounds for, for, for 80 points is still good. Yeah, uh, one of the best units in the book, uh, I've had a funny relationship with the Ungor Raiders, actually. Uh, I've started out running two units of 30, and uh, that's because when they're in bigger units, they get bonuses, they get re-rolls. So they can re-roll ones if there's 20 or more, or ones and twos if there's uh, 30 or more. So I used to run two units of 30, but over time I've whittled it back down to just be 10-man units because the damage isn't the best. Uh, sure, it, it, 
they're just better as a screen, in my opinion. So they've got a six-inch pregame move, which is awesome, especially if you're up against like a one-drop uh, alpha strike. You can push that back. It's also good just to get them out of the way uh, for your other stuff to run in behind them and for them to do their job uh, up the front, zoning off your opponent. I was going to call you out and say I'm pretty sure some of the last lists I saw of yours were in the 20 man ungore raiders so i was curious on why you'd split that split them out into um four multiple small units but at the same time being that they are going to be in the battalion it doesn't change your drops so um it gives you a bit more versatility it obviously means you can threaten more objectives or hold more objectives from behind um and you're obviously not spending a command point if you take massive damage to one unit so um yeah yeah, battle, battle shock's a huge issue for this army early doors. So just by having the 10 mans, you're, you're negating a lot of potential damage coming your way just from battle shock. Because you don't have the bravery 10 like demons. You don't have the double bravery like Skaven. You're, from a chaos perspective, what are you, like fives? Uh, so Ungors and Ungor Raiders are four. Gores are five. Best of Gores are six. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't have the best armor saves in the world. While you do a lot of damage, you don't have the best armor saves. So you will take damage. And um, like I I've made Bulgors run and uh, makes me ha really happy that they ran. But I I my opponent cried a little bit. <laughs> uh, Bulgors aren't so bad for Battleshock because uh, their banner gives them plus one bravery for each enemy unit within 12 inches of them. Uh, you can catch them out, obviously, if it's a big unit, but more often than not, they will sort of stay on the board. But that's why I also keep them in range of the Herdstone, just so they're not running, because they are, uh, yeah, they are a big investment. I'm pretty sure I shot them off, but uh, that's beside the no. point. <laughs> <laughs> Get them out, outside of that 12. Uh, you've I got a Gorgon. It. You've got the Gorgon. I, do, yeah. I love seeing a Gorgon and Cycles. They're probably not my favourite War Scrolls in the world. I feel like Gorgons and Cycles need to be better than what they are. But what does the Gorgon bring to the table? Is it just like this distraction can't affect where people go at it? Does it actually bring something to the table? So I added the Gorgon in my list for two reasons. One was uh, what you just said of being that distraction can't affect. Uh, secondly was because of battle plans like focal points where you get an extra point. Uh, Beast of Chaos, they want to be scoring big and they want to be scoring big early. Right? So having a Gorgon, he just allows me to get that extra couple of points ahead uh, while I'm slowly dying. Uh, he's also not so bad. Like, you know, you can in this list, you can have Neg 3 Rend. He's got lots of attacks. You can have plus one to wounds. He does lots of mortal wounds as well if you if you roll on hot. Um, you can eat a model like a Hecatos or whatever out of a, a, a unit. Um, he's not so bad. People need to... Uh, they write him off too quickly. He's not the Cygor. The Cygor is absolute garbage and never take him. Uh, <laughs> I feel like this. I'm pretty sure the... the Gorgon was more expensive. And at 160 points, like, it's not too bad. Like, you're not spending 300 points for the Gorgon. At 160, it, it, it can be worth its weight because it's almost – it's a unit you can basically let it run off by itself and it does its thing. Like, it doesn't need a lot of support. You can support it, but it doesn't need the support. Um and as you said, if you're scoring extra VP on a, uh, a scenario that requires a behemoth slash monster, um, it does bring something to the table. Uh, he's also another good candidate for extra attacks. So late game, if he's still alive, right, uh, he can potentially have Neg 3 Rend on his both of his attacks uh, with the Herdstone and the spell plus then his Rend uh, that he's got normally. Uh, he's in the battalion, so he can be exploding on sixes. Uh uh, two attack profiles, one does D6 damage, the other one does for fight three. Um, if you pump his attacks up, you know, give him plus three attacks, he's suddenly got like, uh, what is it, five, eight, 12 attacks. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, it's not bad. It's, it's <laughs> I don't, not I don't bad. mind the old Gorgon. I don't not mind bad. The You're right. Like the, points. The, the cycle, I haven't seen a lot of value, but the Gorgon does have value. So uh, it's good to see this in the list. I wouldn't have expected your list to have a Gorgon, but. At the same time, the new battle plans do reward you to look at that. Um, yeah. Would you have had the Gorgon in GBH19 if we had this conversation? No, I had no Warhead elements in my previous yeah. list. So, again, guys, yeah. thinking about the, the new battle plans, what you used last year is not necessarily what you'd use this year. And we are hearing that Joel is taking advantage of the extra uh, victory points 
that are available in some missions because of a leader battle line or um monster behemoth so yeah. good insights yep. any final comments here um you've got the extra command point and you do have the wall the wildfire taurus um i just yep. won one of those on ebay along with the horn but i just wanted that to put into my um my uh my sons of bear moth i'm gonna have one holding like a horn like it's gonna toot nice. um, i don't know what i'm gonna do and i don't know what i'm gonna do with the, the the wildfire taurus yet but i love this this endless spell um one that i think ko, KO players should probably put in the spell in the bottle what does it bring to your armies and why have you spent 80 points essentially on an endless spell um so the wildfire taurus to me and playing this army a shitload is when that's on I don't care about the priority roll. So uh, I tend to usually give priority away if the wildfire Taurus is on the board, actually, just because I don't need to take it. Uh, yeah, I'm zoning out the objectives to my opponent. I'm hitting them with this thing because I get to control it. It's doing potentially D6 mauls on a whole heap of different units. It's making them fight last. It's got to be one of the best spells in the game. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't think I agree with you that it's good for KO because they're not getting into combat, but um, it's it's definitely up there as a contender for spell and a bottle, definitely. Yeah, I, look, I, I, I yeah, look compared compared to the vault. I mean, there's, there's not the KO show, so let's not we'll talk about it. Yeah, but I do, I do, <laughs> I do find this this endless spell quite good. Um, yeah, I do like it. Yeah, yeah, it, it's great. And look, as I was saying, if it's on, I don't care about the priority role, which a lot of armies these days they seem to really care about it. Uh, yeah. You know, they want that double turn or they want to get it so their army doesn't get the shit pushed in. Um, yeah, it's it's a really good spell. And I think that See, every list should take it. Uh, and I'm going to about to contradict myself when we look at the second list. <laughs> <laughs> I think every list should take it. And my second list has the flock of birds. Um, this, list, <laughs> this, this list is coming in at, I don't know, it was like 2K. Or I can't remember exactly how many points because I cut it off on the screen. Overall... Lots and lots of bodies, a couple of good hero choices, although I would say that your heroes are quite squishy. So um, yes. I, I, I imagine that a, a KO, a shoot cast, anything that has really good shooting or long-range shooting, you could lose your heroes quite quickly, but otherwise you're flooding the board with bodies, you've got uh, fast movement, you've got <clears> some good attacks, um, you've got a whole bunch of tools in this list. With, with the... with. Uh, my hero is dying. I don't really care uh, because they turn to spawns, which are more important in this list anyway. So, yeah, it's not such a bad thing if Shootcast or KO want to kill my Doom Ball. I don't, he's 100 points. I don't care. The 50 point spawn that he turns into is way better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, fair call. Although you would, you know, once you lose your wizard, you do lose your Wildfire Taurus, but. Again, you're winning. You're you're, you're 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 not winning the game by heroes. Like heroes are not winning you games. It's going to be your bodies. It's going to be flooding the board. It is going to just be getting in people's faces, pinning them in their side of the territory, denying objective claim, and using movement to 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 basically win your game, which is ultimately Age of Sigma. Age of Sigma is movement. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, this list will struggle a bit on against those matchups. Uh, on like you know place of arcane power or whatever but you can't win them all right so it's no. yeah good call good call you can't win them all you cannot build a list to win them all and win every scenario because every opponent is going to be different but you've got plenty of tools yep next one the one that i enjoy the most if i ever played beast of chaos this is the way i would build i really like dark walkers uh, Dark Walkers does give you a cool bunch of things. So first things first, <clears throat> Shadow Beasts, which is basically we talked earlier about Bray Herds being able to be put into reserve and they come in in the first battle round in the movement phase. This basically allows you to have the War Herd and Thunderscorn units in a Dark Walkers army. They essentially are treated the same way as Bray Herds. So you can basically put on your War Herd, your Thunderscorn and your Bray Herd keyword units in reserve uh, in addition, up to half of the reserve units can arrive in the second movement phase. So without that, they all have to come on in the first movement phase. This gives me flexibility to come in on the second and bring in War Herds and Thunder Scorn as well as Bray Herd. So basically everything but your monsters, right? Like your Cockatrice, your, you know, your Java Slides, your Chaos Gargan. Most of your army is going to have one of those three keywords. Yeah, that's right. Um, 
yeah, it, it's it's really handy, especially if you're building away from regular Bray herd. So it just gives you that flexibility. I like it. You know, being able to ambush, you know, your bull gores, for example, uh, that's very terrifying as opposed to having to hide them behind a, you know, a, a wave of cheap screens. Yeah. Your artifact is the Desolate Shard, which uh, once per battle at the start of the hero phase, one bearer, so the bearer can use the, the shard if they're within three inches of a terrain feature. If they do so, roll a dice for each enemy within one inch of that terrain feature. On a four plus, they suffer D3 mortal wounds. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. It's it's probably the most garbage, useless artifact in the whole book. <laughs> it's just it's so pretty bad. situational, right? Like it's pretty situational. Oh, you got to be within three inches of the terrain feature, and then roll a dice on a four plus. You do D three mortal wounds to things that are within one inch of the terrain feet. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's a piece of poo. <laughs> I tell you what, it could be but good against though. You if, you, if you if if you go up against like I don't know Seraphon with the with their you know big pyramid, or you have the uh, the Bone Tithe Nexus, you know in the middle of the board, and you're obviously rushing up the board. That's a pretty big terrain feature, and it's a better shot. But outside of those two big terrain features, it's pretty situational. Yeah, usually I'd put this on uh, the shaman babysitting the herdstone just in case if people try and come and sh uh, shut down my summoning, you can pop that and actually get use out of it. It's the only time. Oh, and it's also one for battle. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't build a strategy around this, ladies and gentlemen. Do not build no. this. This is not your strategy. You're building a brown. <laughs> it's nice if it happens. And it doesn't matter. You probably forget it <laughs> half the time. <clears throat> yep. You've got Nomadic Leader, which uh, adds one to the run rolls for friendly Dark Walker units while they're whole while they're wholly within twelve inches of the general. That's pretty cool. It's not bad. Not bad at all. Plus one to the run roll. Yeah, like well, yeah especially when all the Bray Herd stuff are running and charging. Yeah, you know, yeah, it turns that uh, ten with a shaman to an eleven plus D six, which is just awesome. It may Very mean fast. that you don't need to spend that command point to re-roll or so not re-roll, add make it six. Uh or it could just be that extra one inch that's gonna make that um that charge a whole lot easier um because of that run and charge. Mm. Finally, you've got the savage encirclement. So you can choose this command ability at the end of your movement phase. Uh, if you do so, pick one, uh, pick a friendly Dark Walkers unit more than nine inches from an enemy unit, wholly within 18 of a friendly Dark Walkers hero. Remove that unit from the battlefield and place it to one side at the end of the next movement phase. Um, or at the end of your next movement phase, set that unit up anywhere on the battlefield more than nine inches away from enemy units. So it's a teleport. Yep. It's a, a next it turn is. teleport. Yep. So it is good uh but it is not as good as any other teleport in the game uh because your units are missing out on say that next shooting phase and charge phase and combat phase yeah. um i traditionally use this well, i have in the past with a couple of chimeras turn one i'll pluck them off the board uh and then you know in my turn two they can come down and do 2d6 mortal wounds to something and uh, they've also got plus two to charge naturally so they're a good candidate for uh picking them up and then dumping them somewhere else. Uh, apart from that, I don't really use it, um, but it could be a clutch game, like clutch winning game, uh, or move rather, sorry. Uh, it's uh, you know, late stages of the game uh, by picking something up in turn three or four and then your opponent forgetting about it, uh, yeah. and then you drop them down on an undefended objective. So, yeah. Especially if you get double turn, uh, an opponent <clears throat> might forget about it. You know, something like Knife to the Heart, for example, this could be, you know, because Knife to the Heart, for example, is going to be really hard for you to, to to potentially ambush into because your units have to come in turn one, turn two at most. But by having that that turn four, turn five, late game kind of coming in teleport, um, that could be a clutch. I love it. Um, situational, but useful. Mm. More than nine inches from the enemy. 18 of the Dark Walker hero, but then it comes in nine inches um, from an enemy. So you still got to get the nine inch charge unless you get the natural pluses or you get like chronomatic cogs to to, to, yep. to boost that charge. Yeah, so it's, you're really... it's, it's useful. It's useful, but you're really taking Dark Walkers to allow, to unlock your Bulgors. Uh, well, sorry, your, yeah, your Bulgors and your Thunder Scorns to be able to ambush, right? So yeah, that's but, yeah, general. from. from 
for me, the Shadow Beast rule, which is that that War Herd Thunder Scorn, is why you take that. That's the that's the key. Everything else is bonus. <clears throat> so you've got a list here. The Great Freight is Dark Walkers, Surprise of the Century. Who saw that coming? You've got two heroes. You've got a Bull Gore and you have a, a Great Bray Shaman. The Bull Gore is the general, has nomadic leader. It has the champion's doom cloak. And then the Great the great Bray Shaman has the Desolate Shard, which is our um, uh, our sub-allegiance artifact. And we're coming in with the Tendril spell. So um, some combinations that are similar to, to the last list, but a few things that are different. So talk me through the, the Doom Bull. Yep, so Doom Bull is the general. He unlocks Bulgors' battle line. Um, he has the... Oh, so he's got the command trait, obviously, for Nomadic Leader. Uh, and um, his artifact, it's been a while since I've looked at the Doom Bulls artifacts. I'm pretty sure that turns him into a Stonehorn when he charges. Uh, so you roll your roll your dice and do mortal wounds. Uh, this is the Champion's Doom Cloak. Uh, just bring it up here. It's either that or plus the charge. Uh, uh, it's a plus the charge. So add two to the charge roll made by, for the bearer. Yeah. So... Uh, Seven's the charge. He's generally ambushing him with the unit of nine, uh, which you can drop that back to a six and add another Doom Bull or uh, Bray Shaman or whatever. This is more of just an archetype kind of build, more so than what I would play all the time. Um, but, yeah, so he, he's he's a good little beat stick to uh, ambush in turn one, uh, plus two to charge. He can get in and potentially kill something, which is always nice. And as you mentioned, unlocks Bulgors as a uh, battle line. So obviously that's going to be yeah. wonderful for scoring additional objectives in some scenarios. Mm -hmm. um, the Br the Great Bray Shaman, I imagine, plays a similar role to the last list. It's a bit of a stabby stabby, obviously yeah. casts a spell, just a general utility piece. Mm -hmm. That's all he's doing. <laughs> and he's throwing out with his spell, um, Neg one to saves against enemy units that get too close. And, and that only goes off on a six as well. Although the range is short, it's within 12 inches of the caster. Six yeah. inches, yeah, sorry, a, a, a six to cast uh, isn't too hard. And the, the minus one to save rolls just combine so well with the neg two from the bull gores or um, yeah. just some of the damage output you're putting out. That's right. Uh, then the unit selection is you've got nine bull gores with great axes, six bull gores with great axes. You've got six bull gores with axes and bull shields. That's a little bit different. We have 10 ungore raiders, 40 ungores, 10 ungore raiders. And I'm so excited. The mind stealer, the sphinx. It's not it's not called a sphinx, but I'm calling it the sphinx. The, the, the sphinx. That, what it, Sphinx. It's a it's a Sphinx, ladies and gentlemen. You've also got the, the Gorgon, and you've come in with the Battalion Hungering War Herds. Uh, one extra command point, no endless spells, despite, despite Joel telling us that you don't leave home without the Wolf, the, the, the Taurus. <laughs> <laughs> literally literally con contradicting himself. Why so many bull gores? Why a nine? Why do we have one that has axes and bull shields instead of great axes? Talk me through why you have so much bull gores. Sure. So firstly, all the uh, so the doom bull, the bull gores, and also the gorgon are all in the battalion. Uh, the hungering war herd, which gives them an extra three inches when they pile in. Now it doesn't mean that they can pile in from six inches. It just means that they get an extra three inches to pile. In. So when you've got okay. uh, big bases, uh, they're all on 50 mils, all the bulgors. Uh, having that extra three inches means that they can actually get into combat. Uh, so that's, yeah, it's just great. Uh, plus, if uh, I call him Gary, so the Gorgon, if he charges at the end of something and he wants to actually get into something else, he can with the extra three inches because uh, he's got a, you know, he's on the, on the large base, the 120. So, yeah, he can do that. It's, it's useful. Soaking the Doom Bull, so uh, just by being able to wrap around something and hitting the back of something else. Uh, yeah, so that's that. Um, they're, I, I just really like them uh, in this list because you can ambush them. Um, they've got the extra three inches piled in. And they can actually hurt stuff too sometimes. <laughs> what, 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 now, what about the one unit that has axes and bull shield as opposed to the yeah. Great Axe? So that's just uh, they believe it or not, that is not a formatting error. That's that's deliberate, and that's because they're going to be one of the uh, 
battle line units which are holding objectives on, say, better part of Valor where you have to stay on the objectives to score it. So uh, and it, what, what that gives them is a plus one to save in combat. So they've now got a four up instead of a always five up, which you know, it, it's going to let them stay on the board for a little bit longer, right? So they're a little bit more defensive by, by having the shield, essentially. Yeah. Look, I don't actually mind the one-handed axes on them either because Bulgors, uh, they get an extra attack when they don't have the big axe. So it's only neg one rend two damage as opposed to neg two three damage. But uh, they still do the mortal wounds on sixes to wounds. So, you know, they've got more dice that they're throwing at the problem. So I don't actually mind uh -huh. the double-handers either. I only call it out because 99% of the times you see them, you know, doubling down on the great axes. You're going for that Ren minus two. You're just going through absolute damage. I don't think I've ever seen anyone run the axes and the shield, but obviously the utility piece and what they bring to the table is different. They're not there to go out ambush and go, you know, cut sick. They're there to protect. They're there to hold the objective and yeah, make, make, makes complete sense. Now we've got that unit while we have the nine and the other six with the great axes. Uh, anything else? Yeah. Anything else there? No, not, not for the, not for the bulls. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty much them. Makes sense. You got 10 Ungor Raiders and then 40, uh, oh, sorry, you got two units of 10 Ungor Raiders. Yeah. So, uh, they're just, you know, to, to push up, uh, this drop, uh, this list is a bit higher drop. So it's what, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, it's a six drop. So it's not getting first turn or the choice uh, very often these days. So those Ungor Raiders just help to mitigate any alpha strike potential. And that's obviously coming Plus through the vile. That's the vile invaders where after the armies are set up, but before the first battle round, uh, the unit can move six inches, which is pretty sweet. Yes. Yep. But you're not taking advantage of the re-rolling ones because you don't have the unit of 20. That's right. Don't need to. They're just there to die, mate. <laughs> like I would, I would literally, literally, literally the question coming out of my mouth was, would you ever combine that as a unit of 20? And I think no, the answer is no. Point. No point. Uh, twenty a unit of twenty covers less of the board. It zones out less than two units of ten, just because you've got uh, the potential eighteen inches in between the two units uh, to zone off that uh, that area, right? So, unit of twenty is uh, what forty inches wide. Um, then nine on each side. Then you've got um, two units of ten, which can just zone off the entire board. Uh, board length because you got 9, 18, 27, 36, 46, 56, <laughs> 56? Oh, then another 10, yeah. So that's just how I think about it. It just covers up more space on the board. Then you said on a Friday night you couldn't do maths after a few yeah. beers. I, th I think oh, you've, you've hit your peak. <laughs> Mate, I'm in a tournament. If I'm not drinking or drunk already, there's something seriously going wrong. So uh, <laughs> anyone who's met me in an event knows that I'm a piss head. Give it 10 minutes, guys, and uh, Joel will hit a wall. So he, he's, he's at math's peak right now. He's going to completely not know 2 plus 2 very <laughs> soon. Um, you've got the 40 Ungors, so they're obviously going to be able to do some re-rolling hits because you've got more than 30 there, which is pretty sweet. They can re-roll so, hit, hit, hits of 1 and 2 while they're above 30. Reason why I went for the 40 here, I've never actually ran this list, but I will start running units of 40 Ungors soon. Uh they're 200 points for 40 models, 40 wounds, which is just bargain basement, right? But uh, this unit covers multiple roles in this list. It's uh, not only on herdstone duties, but it's also trying to hold objectives. So uh, this list, when you run Bulgors, you lack bodies. That's just the way that it is. You've got uh, elite units, so you want to try and cram as much shit as you can into the, an army. And um, the 40 is just the cheapest way to do it. Um, yeah. Why Why the half shields? Because the half shield gives them the, the plus one to the armor safe, but you're only moving that from a six to a five. Like, why yeah. wouldn't you just go with the other, the, you know, instead of having the mauls going the, oh, they've all got, they've all got shields. Ignore me. You've got blades or short spears. Uh, uh, yeah. Wh why the mauls as opposed to the other option? Uh, so the mauls hit on fours. Uh, the spears are fives. That's just your traditional uh, spears versus uh, one. Two inch versus inch. one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, they're twenty-five mil bases, so you're still getting two ranks. 
whatever's charging them is usually probably going to be hitting them first anyway, so the unit's going to just disappear. So you may as well just hit better with what's left than uh, not. <laughs> and, hey, you know, hitting on fours, re-rolling ones and or twos, depending on if you've got 20 or 30. Um, or, yeah, I mean, once they're above 30, they're, they're twos. If you reduce them at one. So fours, re-rolling ones and twos is pretty good. Um, oh, there's no random one damage. Yeah, like that's really cheap for 200 points. Is that um, massive? Is that is that mass regiment discounted as well? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. Plus, then they'll also have neg one rend because they're next to the herd zone. So they're fours re rolling ones, potentially twos, then fours neg one one damage. So they're not actually as bad as what uh, their reputation gives them credit. And for. remembering as well, to get to those ungores, you're going to have to go through the bull gores. So they probably would have put you through the ringer before you eventually yeah. got to those ungores. So, um, <laughs> And for that exact reason is why I love the Herdstone for because it really comes into its own um, it, uh, at like late stage of the game uh, just by uh, making Ungors hit like Vestigors, essentially not quite but basically the same close uh, it, yeah it's it's just a huge difference so that's why I love the Herdstone that's why I think it's the best uh, piece of terrain in the game. Let's talk about the mind. Yeah, make Ungors great. Um, all yep. it takes is a uh, a stabby, stabby rock. <laughs> the Mind Stealer. Talk to me about this because this isn't in the battle tome. So some people are going, no. wait a second. How 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 did he how did he bring this into the mix, and why would he bring in an ally, Mind Stealer? Yep. So the Mind Stealer's Franks is a Slaves of Darkness unit, which is pretty much the only ally choice for Basic House. Uh, and what this does is it fills a similar role to what the uh, the Flaming Bull does, right? So the Endless Spell, which I don't have in this army uh, because I've only got one wizard, right? So if he dies, it's just useless. At least in the other list, I had two, so it's not so bad. But um, the, the Monsters for Ranks, it's a monster, so it nets me an extra point on focal points, uh, and it also is making stuff fight last. And when you've got Bulgors who are very fragile and glass hammery, if two units can swing a set of one before the opponent can, you're, you're just making money there. So that's why he's in the list. Would you ever see yourself in a world where you'd have both the Taurus and the Mind Stealer? I've considered it. Um, I wouldn't take it in my regular tournament build like the one before because it's just an extra drop at the end of the day. I still want the spawn in the list. Um, but in this, I could see myself dropping out, uh, you know, some bull goals or whatever and adding in another one if I wanted to. Uh, I'm just thinking, like, you know, being able to make two units strike last could be quite attractive, especially then with your bull goals coming in at full strength. What are they, 100 points each? Yeah, you could take four of them in a base of Chaos Army, no worries, because you've got so many different units. Um, yeah, you just need yeah. A, yeah. You're only limited by your ally pool, so, yeah, you could get four in, um, which is pretty good. Yeah, which, honestly, the bull is uh, hitting at most, like, four units at a time anyway, so you could take four mind stealers for ranks if you really wanted to. They I have ten wounds. They have, yeah, I, I, yeah, they have ten wounds. I, I was expecting yeah. eight, seven, ten. Oh, yeah, they're, they're not a bad point. little monster. Yeah, no, 100 points, not, actually. 10 points of wounds, netting an extra point, making stuff fight and last. And for 100 points, they're actually pretty good in combat for what you're getting. They're better than 100 points of ungores, for example. So, yeah, yeah, no, that's fair. That's fair. Definitely, definitely good pick up there. Uh, Gorgon, I imagine, plays a similar role to the last list. Again, Behemoth yeah. gets you some extra points, does a bit of damage. Um, has yeah, a lot uh, of he's wounds. also uh, attacks in the battalion as well. You have to take one of a uh, Gorgon or a Cygor. Um The Cygor will never see a. a I was going to say place in a list of mine. So <laughs> I was going to say you obviously take the Gorgon at all costs. Uh, poor old yeah. Cygor needs a rewrite of Battle Scroll, War Scroll. I was um, comparing the Cygor to an Iron Blast the other night with one of my mates, Pete Atkinson, and um, Cygor is just. Far worse than the Iron Blaster, and the Iron Blast is, is perceived as bad in more tribes, right? So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's it's not great. Real. It's not no. great. I'm like, if a, if a cycle was coming towards me, I just go, I just open the gates, like, yep, yeah, cool, bro, no problems, just come in, no issues from me, like, please, whatever. 
I'm not worried about slag gores. Yeah, no. If it had the blood greed rule, like what the rest of the uh, bulgore, well, sorry, warherd units have, where they do mortals on sixes, it wouldn't be so bad because it's got uh, like eight attacks base, I think. Um, so, you know, you've got a potential to do a couple of mortals on top, but it just doesn't have that rule for some reason. So, no. Nah. Because it has one eye. It has one eye. They're, yeah. they're, they're racist against people with one eye. Come on, Psychos. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get going down a weird track. Um, yeah, yeah. Cool list, man. That's a really cool list. I guess I've got a couple of final questions, but I think we've shown off a couple of different builds and, you know, you're really doubling down on taking advantage of the, the speed in the army. You're, you're doubling down on the amount of bodies, the wounds. Um, you've always got some really cool summoning. You've shown us some different ways whether the, the through the Taurus or whether it's through the Mind Stealer, um, some ways to fight last. You obviously talked about some of the summoning. So I, I think they've got some tools there is probably some hard counters, certainly some hard matchups. This is certainly not a five and O oh, unless you've got mad skills and you've practiced a lot. Um, I imagine two and three and three and two is probably what you can expect for the average player. Is that probably fair with beast that's, where they're at right now? Yeah, that's right. And look, you know, the, I don't like looking at and comparing the win percentages to how well an army can actually do on the board, but that seems to be about right. I think we're sitting at about 30% now. So between two and three wins. Yeah. Obviously, you know, if you do any better, it means that you are a good player and you're doing it as opposed to, oh, I'm, I've got Lord Croak with a with a, a Bowwind Vortex and an Ashleth Bearer and I'm going to do mortal wounds and burn everything with Salamanders. Really, how much did you do in that army? You just piloted yeah. it. You, you, you pointed and clicked, right? And that's the thing. Literally. Like, you have to play out of your skin with Beast of Chaos more often than not. Like at, at the end of an event, I'm absolutely knackered because... Yeah, it's just so taxing physically because you're moving so many models around and mentally just because you're yeah. thinking about everything. It's it's unreal, but it's good. Reminds fun. me of my gits, man. I, I'm always brain drained because I've got like all these different synergies and these different combinations and you're just like basically like Rain Man with just all the information with you and you work your ass off to get that third win. Um, yeah. But it's always rewarding. Yeah. <laughs> I... I I just kind of like tried, I, I thought I summarized the way that you win, right? You're winning because of movement. You're winning because you're getting victory points early in the game and you're trying to get a huge win and probably reducing the opponent. I imagine that you're not very good in turn four, turn five. Like you're most effective at the start of the game. How how are you winning your games generally? It's actually the opposite to that, Coach. Um, okay. Beast of Chaos scramble really well. Uh, so if you can if you can whittle the attrition game down to just a couple of units each, and you know everyone's just spent, and there's just uh, you know a unit of two or three models here and there, we do really well because uh, we suddenly become immune to battle shock because of the herd stone, and then because it, it's got a thirty inch range on it, right? So it's covering most of the board by turn five, and um, we're also got the extra rend, so we're just getting more attacks through and more damage. Um, so more often than not, you're scrambling really well. If you can set yourself up through the rest of the game, uh, make your army bleed the way that you want it to, lose the units that you, you, you're happy to, uh, then you can scramble really well at the end. Sometimes you can just blow people off the board. You know, I've tabled a couple of people before with base, you know, pull them. <laughs> but, but, yeah, it usually just scrambles really well. That's interesting because I haven't, I've only really played one or two. I, I've probably played less than five games against Beasts of Chaos. It's just not an army I see very often. And I've always imagined, and the way I've always played against them or had my opponent play against me has been they've, tr they've tried to almost iron jaws me. They've come at me very early on, tried to do a bunch of damage. Your bull gores, just, you know, your gorgons, try to do a bunch of damage. And and, and hopefully I can't punch you back harder than you punch me. And you've basically racked up these victory points at the start. And hopefully I don't have enough power to kind of swing it back late. But it's interting that you say that. So, um, yeah, okay. But I, I guess I, I used to break... play... Sorry. I used to play like that where I would sort of go in for the kill early on just to try and do as much damage as possible as early as possible. Um, it just... No, it, it doesn't work. It, it works, but it doesn't work as well, I think. Is, um, I remember I said at the start, you're in the driver's seat, you're taking control of the entire game. As soon as you make a mistake, you're stuffed. You are in control of how your army dies. And it's only a certain few armies, like uh, uh, armies which have a lot of bodies as well, with a lot of attacks, who can just 
blow you up really quick uh, is where you struggle doing this. Uh, so like corn marauders, for example, or uh, big wah with hard boys, you know, they can mm. just sort of kill you a bit too fast. Um, but yeah, you want to be using those 10 mans just to, to block stuff in and, you know, you, I'd prefer to lose one unit of 10 men uh, from their hammer who they've buffed up than, you know, the unit of the 30 best of yours, for example. So you need to be in control. You need to be thinking 100% about board space, what you're occupying, what you're zoning off and what you're blocking. Um, yeah. No, <laughs> There's lots no of that's cool about. because it's interesting you say that again because you and I have never played um, – well, I don't think we've ever played actually, but we've no, never we certainly played Beast of Chaos. But um, every time I've played against Beast of Chaos, I've always won. And it's always been that. It's always been about absorbing their damage, you know, giving up cheap screens and then punching them back and kind of disarming them. So it sounds like you found a new way and a be maybe a better way. Um, and again, the list that we're seeing here uh, are a good example of how you're thinking about using movement taking the opponent down over the full five as opposed to that first two rounds of just carnage that maybe wasn't isn't the right suit for this style. Yeah, look, it's just the evolution of the play style really. Like, um, you know, I, as I was saying, I used to play like uh, what you've played against and what you've experienced before. But, um, you know, I just sort of changed a couple of things. I've just thought about it a little bit more. And um, instead of just, you know, I, I really feel – Oh, this is going to insult a few people here, but I really feel playing like uh, Gristle Gore or Iron Jaws or whatever, where you're just rushing in turn one and, you know, hoping for the best. Uh, it sort of rots your brain a bit on how uh, you can actually play this game differently and uh, more successfully. Uh, so, yeah, just think about the objectives, the space, uh, what you're occupying and you know, so on and so forth. No, and it, it makes complete sense to me because I always felt, I, I always didn't feel that it, it was their style. Um, that turn one alpha striking, get in front of your face, never felt like Beast of Chaos. And even from my days of Warhammer Fantasy Battles, that didn't, didn't really feel like Beasts. Beasts was all about ambushing. It was all about, you know, manipulating the board. It was about movement and kind of positioning. And you know, in the old days, you know, you'd hit the flank and you'd try to, like, wrap around while that was the style that I felt, you know, going through terrain, you know, really taking advantage of your opponent. So I, I like what you're they, sharing, and I hopefully we'll see more of that on the table. I'd like to see yeah, more Beasts of Chaos. I honestly would like to see more Beasts of Chaos on the table. Yeah, they're a really cool army, and they play true to their fluff as well. Like, you, when was the last time you heard of a Beast of Chaos army hitting the board, uh, hitting hitting a battlefield and, you know, going toe-to-toe -to -toe with someone? It's, it never happens. It, they're always, <laughs> you know, baiting you into the army uh, to so try and bleed, out, bleed you out and uh, then kill you from there. Right. And that's where the Herdstone comes into play is you, if you go to out turn one, uh, then you're not getting any bonuses uh, for your allegiance abilities, right? So if you can hold back for a turn or two, let them come to you while you're still slowing them down enough, uh, that's when you can strike and then you know, take all their toys off. It reminds me of when I used to play Legion of Night because I'd always run Manfred and people would always get disappointed by running Manfred like a vampire lord on Zombie Dragon, you know, run up to center of the board and just try to kill your opponent. But that's not Manfred. In the law, Manfred is sneaky. He will, um, you know, ambush and sabotage. And that's when I always got the best out of Manfred was by playing how he was in the law. So it sounds like Beasts of Chaos are the same. Don't try to fit it into a play style. Play as they are written. And yep. um, I like that. I like the complementary um, law and play style. Yep. Yep. Play the faction. Don't play the list, basically. <laughs> love it so that kind of brings me to my last question before we wrap things up from your experience and obviously we've heard a lot about the transition and you've had from your lists from early days to now what have you learned what are some of the things that are of that are that are obvious to you now that you wouldn't have known years ago oh that's a that's a tough question um so years ago let, let's go back oh, like, to, um... like through your experience like through your experience what have you learned that if I was to pick up Beasts of Chaos right now and, and just read the War Scrolls in your legions, it may not be as obvious to me because I haven't played with it yet and I haven't moved them around the table. Yeah. Um, doing as little as possible to get the maximum gain uh, is definitely a thing. So uh, we were talking about just then about overcommitting models, right? Instead of that unit of 30 Ungor Raiders to zone off the, the opponent, couple of tens you're yeah, committing less resources to do the same job right um yeah it's just 
picking and choosing um, how your army bleeds, basically, because you, you're going to die because you're basically chaos. So uh, it's, yeah, just, you know, think about that. Uh, what can I do uh, to do the same thing but for, you know, cheaper? Uh, and that's what I would have liked to have known. Instead of looking at stats and numbers, it's just about, you know, what actually does the job. That's, yeah. It's sort of hard to explain, I think, but that's um, no, that's no, no. What it, it makes learned. it makes perfect sense, and it complements quite well your new list, where you have a lot of small units. And in the past, people might go for those big blocks of thirty and forty, um, you know, modeled in the units. But by throwing away and knowing that because you don't have the best armor saves in the world, you're not you're not Petrifix Elite, uh, you're not Phoenix Guard. Things are going to die. It's accepting that and using those bait tactics to throw away units, tie up your opponent, um, deny them from claiming objectives, all while protecting, you know, your, your bull gores. And then they come in for that round two and just absolutely cut sick. But knowing that your ungores, your best of gores, your, um, your ungore raiders are going to die, don't sacrifice them completely and just don't throw them away, but no. accept that they're going to die, but make the most of it. That's right. Yep. Make their make their sacrifice count. Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Just don't throw them at your opponent. It kind of again goes well with don't throw them turn one at your opponent and then they all die. And it's like, oh, like really be smart, manipulate, retreat, uh, tag and charge things that, you know, think about where you tag them and kind of charge and kind of, you know, make the most of your board control. Yeah. Um, one other thing I'd like to say is uh, there's a thing in the game called retreating. Uh, use that to your advantage with Beast of Chaos because, um, you know, tactically retreating is something which people sort of don't do a whole lot, but you do see it on the top tables a fair bit. And um, basically, say a unit of 10 ungles or whatever, uh, after Battle Shock, there's only like, I don't know, four left, right? Those four, uh, they don't need to be in combat because they're not going to do anything. But what they're actually doing is uh, essentially killing. Uh, four or cancelling out four of your opponent's models on an objective, right? So they may as well be on the board instead of uh, just dying for the sake of it. So it, it means that you've got less to kill with the more stuff that you've got on the board because you're generally outbodying people. Yeah. You do see people just sticking to combat. You're like, oh, I might as well just keep these four into combat when actually you could retreat and try to screen off and kind of, you know, manipulate the board and force someone to charge or maybe retreat and try to harass somewhere else or Well, they can uh, retreat reset the screen up as well. You know? Yeah, literally. Or you might even try to retreat and then get into combat with a squishy hero that they've left open now. Um, mm -hmm. I think, yeah, you're right. A lot of people don't think enough about retreating. Um, and because you've got some cool stuff like the retreat, you know, the can you retreat and charge or have you just got run no, and charge? not in this list. Unfortunately, we're not Skaven. <laughs> I was going to say Skaven we... has that, but, you know, even being able to retreat and then set it up for the next turn, which might be the double turn and you get to run and charge into a squishy hero, um, a, a soft buff piece like a Huracanum or something. like. Yeah. And same can be said about, um, so sticking units into combat or just leaving them in there, not retreating. Same can be said about doing multiple charges. So this army is really fragile. So you want to be striking first and taking as little casualties as possible for the attrition game. Uh, your units are better off not charging, even though they can, just to stay sitting there on an objective, right? Um, because you don't want your opponent hitting them first. No, yeah, that's a good, good yeah. tip. Good tip. Again, something that people will need to think about, wrap their heads around. And again, we're hearing from a player who's, who's played at the highest level at the Australian masters. So, um, You've done really well with Beast of Chaos. You've done well generally in the game. So it's been awesome to kind of pick your brain and hear how people can take advantage of this faction that people don't talk about very often. You, it's hard to find bat reps. It's hard to find tactic videos. It's just generally something that people aren't talking about because they're not high in the meta. So uh, there is a place for them. It's great to hear your thoughts. And hopefully if you are a Beast of Chaos player, you're encouraged. If you are thinking about it because you love the models, it's something that you get into and now have a bit of a framework on where to start. Yeah, man. And um, look, you just said something about uh, not many battle reports for Beasts of Chaos. Uh, <laughs> I did it. I, I did it on there, purpose. There is one place that you can find on the internet uh, on YouTube. Where is that, Joel? Where, of, where, <laughs> it's on the uh, it's where, called Measured Gaming, I think. 
Measure Gaming okay. on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. uh, they they do heaps and heaps of battle reports with Beast of Chaos in them. Uh, piloted by myself. <laughs> it's my channel. But it's, uh, go check it out. Go and subscribe too. We're almost hit a thousand, which is nice. Um, yeah. All right, well, I, I point it down. Uh, when I upload this on YouTube, uh, the the link to Measured Gaming, go check them out. If you want to watch some fun battle reports where that have a competitive landscape, but also they enjoy themselves. And I think that's one of the things that I love about Measured Gaming, both your podcast and your uh, battle reports, is that you do feel like you guys are just a, a bunch of friends who are having fun, win, lose, or draw. I mean, there's some people who are a bit more salty, Pat, uh, but generally, you guys are a lot of a lot of fun. No, you guys are awesome. Uh, it's been awesome hanging out with you, you lads. But go check them out. Measure Gaming. Any other shout outs you want to shout out your crew? You've obviously shouted out your your your, your battle reps. Uh, no, I'm not going to shout out my crew. They're a bunch of salty. Uh, oh, no, no C word. Don't, don't word. use the C yeah. word. <laughs> don't, don't, make, don't make me beep it. <laughs> That'll be the first video I've ever beeped in my two and a half years of YouTubing. Please don't make uh, me beep. I should have said it. Um, no. <laughs> um, now, I will say, though, if you do go check us out, we do swear and use curse words a lot. Um, so I've been on my best behaviour tonight. <laughs> uh, just a heads up, okay? Uh, <laughs> You've done well. And, yes, the, 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 the filter is off on Joel's channel. So I can't wait to be invited one time where I get to return the, set, the favour. But, no, go check them out. Yeah, for sure. Joel, it's a Friday night. Thank you very much for your time. Folks, if you enjoyed this, you know what to do. Smash the like button. Smash it on Joel's channel. Go subscribe. Uh, get them to 1,000. Let them retire rich with all their YouTube monies that you get, uh, <laughs> you know, all that ethereal internet dollars that Joel is just craving for. Help me get 1,000 Yeah, uh, I, need, I need one more there. beer. I clearly don't have enough. <laughs> you, just need, you just need a longer beard like I do. Like just the, the, oh, the beard okay. brings the subs. Is that what I'm doing wrong, is it? <laughs> All right. I'll See you, folks. <laughs> Thanks, Kate. See you, Joel. Thanks, mate. Bye. G'day. I hope you enjoyed that video and you're left with some new ideas. One of the biggest ways you can contribute to AOS Coach is by liking the video you just watched and leaving a comment in the comment section. This lets YouTube know this is a good video and it should recommend it to other hobbyists. If you'd also like to support the channel even further like these bloody legends, go check out AOS Coach on Patreon. Otherwise, don't forget your triumph.